Combat 101, creating cohesive combat. Uh, what I want to do is go over my systematic approach that I use to analyze, improve, and create combat systems from scratch. Before we begin, first who I am. Uh, I've been nicely introduced, but uh, I'm Marcus Cerro. I am currently the senior combat designer on the Prototype 2 team here at Vancouver's very own Radical Entertainment. Now, I've been fortunate enough to be a game designer for the last 12 years. And in those 12 years, uh, come this April, um, I'll have shipped my 13, lucky 13 game. Um, and uh, what's important to, to see about my background is in those 12 years, I've worked for seven different studios. And what that has done, it's, um, it's given me exposure to a lot of different technologies, design philosophies, and production processes. So that uh, not only has improved my skills as a designer, but it's also factored, it's also influenced the way I design and to take production in mind. So who I really am, as he's mentioned, is I am a lifelong gamer. Ever since I was a little kid, when my parents asked me what I wanted to do for a reward, I always wanted to go to the arcade and play video games. Uh, even now to this day, um, beyond video games, I, um, I play D&D, Magic the Gathering, uh, Arkham Horror, you know, board games, card games, video games. I am a gamer geek. Um, and as he mentioned, the, uh, actually, the way I was able to get into the video game industry uh, was through tournament playing for fighting games, particularly Street Fighter and Tekken. So literally, I, for me to be able to stand up here in front of uh, most of you, I literally feel like I'm living the dream. I am a gamer who got into the game industry as a gamer, so therefore, when I design video games, to me it's all about your experience. It's all about the gamer's experience and how you interpret things. So, since, uh, since I'm a big nerd gamer geek, we're gonna role play a little bit. We're gonna role play that instead of a presentation, we are now BSF Entertainment Studios and everyone in this audience is now the combat team. So uh, with this, uh, the Publisher X has hired us to make their IP product, the ultimate fantasy game. And so let's go over some of the IP constraints that we have that we're gonna have to work with. First, it's about a knight in shining armor and his end goal is to slay the dragon. I didn't say this IP was creative. I, this is just what the constraints are. Um, and it's important that, and the publisher really wants to point out that um, the reason there's one dragon at the end at the boss is because that's how different this world is. There's no magic in this world. Um, so for a knight in armor with a sword and shield to slay the equivalent of a dinosaur that breathes fire without any magic, that's a pretty heroic event. If you can actually do beat a giant dinosaur one-on-one -on -one and kill it, you're a fracking hero as far as I'm concerned. So that's the gist of this game. Um, that's the, it's a realistic based world. But then they're also known for one other thing in this IP. They want epic loot um, to help motivate the player throughout the game. Okay, so now we've got our constraints. And the lead designer um, tasks us with designing the dragon. Now one thing that the publisher has pushed for is Within the last few years, there's kind of been a few games that, are, uh, that involve dragons that are just incredible. So it's a crowded landscape. So the publisher is really pushing to, no matter what we do, right or wrong with the game, the most uh, important thing is for our dragon to stand out. And so therefore, our primary pillar is, this dragon is gonna be the most awesome dragon in all the video games. Cool. Um, now I start thinking about, hey, what makes a dragon stand out? The big obvious thing is a flame breath. Okay, now let's look at movies for examples and for inspiration. Uh, you often see dragons doing strafing runs over little villages, maybe burning a hut or two, maybe grabbing a cow to eat, uh, mainly just flying on by and scaring the, the crowds. Okay, so that's what a normal dragon does. I want a huge flame breath. I mean, the kind that instead of multiple strafe runs to burn a village, just one giant one that engulfs the entire village, done. Um, that's how big and crazy I want this flame breath to be. Got it. So we're going to separate ourselves from the other dragons. Uh, the other thing I want to look at is uh, being able to let the dragon fly uh, with wings. Not little wings like this. That does not look like an awesome dragon. Instead, I want huge, big, massive wagon, uh, wagon wings <laughs> to, to be able to fly. And here's where I'm going to insert a little bit of my nerdism. Um, if it's got CG and it's a documentary about dinosaurs, I've probably already watched it. So 
with the information I've learned watching these uh, nerd-like documentaries, I found out in order for, to, for a wings to support a dragon of this size and mass, the wingspan has got to be huge. So let's say our dragon is 30 meters tall. Then the wingspan needs to be 80 meters uh, across from, from wingtip to wingtip. Huge, massive. But since we want our dragon to be the most kick-ass dragon, I want to make sure that these massive um, wings also have a lot of articulation in it so it can fly the way it wants to during aerial dogfighting. So we want, we want to focus on really huge wings. Now let's go into some of the attacks that we want for the dragon. Um, I listed off a couple of things. Let's first establish the bite. Uh, let's make this bite be a, uh, one of the highlights of, of the combat, one of the things that people remember. So let's make it a paired animation, and we can use different techniques. You know, the most often talked about one is a QTE, but we'll ignore that for now. Uh, so for this bite attack, we'll make, him, make the dragon rear up kind of like a cobra. This is your anticipation or your attack tail to the player that you're about to be attacked. Then it'll go down in bite. If the player gets hit, now here's where we get to have fun. We work with the animators. We get to mess around with camera work. Let's say the bite is successful. The dragon will flip the player up in the air and then snatch him midair. Then we'll take the camera, zoom on in, show the blood falling out of the mouth, maybe have an arm or a leg hanging out. Sweet, awesome, visceral uh, combat. And you know, this is going to be a moment that players are going to remember. Now we'll move on to some claw attacks. We'll go through some simple ones, you know, maybe a horizontal swipe to make the player either dodge backwards or jump over the attack. We'll have a couple of vertical attacks to make the player move around. OK, got some stuff. Now, nerdism number two. You know, uh, a tail is used to balance the, uh, the creature, the, the dinosaur, the dragon. So when you're talking about a wingspan of 80 over a 30 meter tall, um, tall dragon, that tail is probably going to be the biggest limb that this dragon has. Um, and if you look at a lot of dinosaur behavior, with tails that massive, that tended to be their, one of the primary weapons they would have. So I believe that if dragons were actually existed, they would probably be doing more tail attacks. Bam! Just like that. Um, or even flying in. You can imagine, what if a dragon was flying, swooping in, and then you know, did like a skid turn, and then used all that momentum to smack something with its tail? It'd be a huge, powerful hit. So I want to push for that to make our dragon different from other, the other dragons. Now, we just designed it, so, uh, the dragon. And from my perspective, I'm going to step out of our role as the lead combat designer for VFS Stu Entertainment Studios. And I want to point out what I feel like, well, with that design of their dragon, there was one huge mistake we had done. Or I had done, you guys. Um, and that is, we designed it in a vacuum. We didn't take any other factor into account. So, and I'm gonna go over some of the problems of the dragon, but let's just say uh, we were an old school studio and we built this dragon uh, and without showing anyone else. Um, now, we exposed the, this dragon now to the rest of the team. Here's some of the problems that take place. First, that awesome flame breath that I was mentioning, it just destroyed the frame rate. Now the game's chugging at three frames a second. Mark, we can't ship the game like that. You know, we need to cut back on the flame. Uh, you know, just basically too many particles. OK, so there's something wrong in that we now need to do another iteration on to get it to work right. Then it comes to the flying. All that flying and aerial dogfighting I was mentioning, well, the story guy just gave me a call and was like, you idiot. This whole game started because the dwarves are fighting the cave trolls. So all of our missions are underground. What are you talking about destroying villages and flying up in the air? Oh, damn, I guess that was kind of important information for us to have. Then the wings, these giant massive wings that I wanted to stand out. So that way, when we show the trailers of the game in the monster, you know, we have this great silhouette you know, um, that shows off the game that marketing could use. Well, the amount of, um, the amount of bones that I wanted in the character model, uh, the, the character artists are now telling me that uh, I just destroyed their budget. What I wanted for both the wings is their budget for the entire dragon. So, uh, but they do have a counter offer. So instead of focusing so much on the wings, since the game takes place underneath the ground, they want to focus on the limbs and being able to let the dragon crawl around um, and maybe still throw rocks or boulders at the player from crawling on the landscape and still with its long neck, still being able to breathe fire. So sounds like interesting stuff. And I mentioned this counter because 
That's what a lot of game development is. We're constantly pitching out an idea each other and either compromising or pitching out another uh, counteroffer to get the design to be a better uh, game. So here's where I like to get into the cold reality. The fact is, decisions in a vacuum cost money. It isn't a matter that any of our ideas were bad ideas that didn't sound like it wouldn't make a great dragon fight, but they were done in a vacuum. And I've found there's two reasons why game ideas or solutions to problems don't work. The first is, it's incompatible with the design or vision of the game, i.e., I wanted to fly around and destroy villages, but the game's underneath the ground. Totally different thing. You know, you'll also often hear that the paper design doesn't dictate how fun it's gonna actually be in the game. But I personally believe the number one reasons why paper designs don't work when you get in the game is because you did not factor all the other elements into the game. So we just, uh, sort of this example, I create an entire dragon fight and I never once mentioned what the player can or can't do. When you design an enemy in a vacuum and you design the player's ability in a vacuum, this is what happens in most development. They slap the two things together and they hope that it works out. And when it doesn't work out, then they do another iteration pass, and then another, and then another. This is where I feel like we waste a lot of time and why if you just think about things um, and you apply other designs to what you're working on, you can then get to where you want to go faster. The other reasons why ideas or game designs don't work is simply scope. It's really easy to say in a, in a vacuum, oh, why don't I just take the radiant system from, you know, Bethesda's game and put it into prototype two? Well, that would mean that our programmers would need to spend the next two months putting that engine or the, you know, a, a similar system in place. And then it takes time to, you know, uh, to then you need the, the content time to actually take advantage of it. So most ideas, isn't that the de designers or developers didn't have the idea of what would make the gameplay better, they just ran out of time. It's too expensive, not enough programmer time, not enough animation time, not enough gameplay testing time. For some, uh, so scope is why game ideas don't work. So what I wanna do uh, as we actually go to design, about the game, design the game from here on is we're gonna design with cohesion in place and constantly think about what the other designs that we've established are. The other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna design with production um, efficiency in mind. So in the example that I gave of iterating the dragon, what if uh, when we built the dragon, it took you know, five iterations, and let's say each iteration is one week. So I made the dragon, now I got the dragon to how I want it to be. Now we slap in the player, the player character, and uh, you know, I mentioned before, now things aren't as tight, they're not coordinating well together. That paper design just isn't as fun. Well, now it takes another five iterations. So now, in order to get that boss fight, it now took 10 weeks or 10 iterations. So why I wanna go through all this is, what if it doesn't have to take 10 iterations? What if it only could take just that five? If you just take that five weeks to do this boss fight instead of the 10 weeks, that extra five weeks that you save can be spent on the fun stuff. You can polish up those animations. You can take the time to play the game, do focus tests, and to, uh, to prove out your concepts and to see what's actually fun or not fun. Additionally, we've talked about different features, you know, uh, maybe we couldn't do the radiant system or something similar um, because it takes seven weeks and we only have two weeks. Well, I just save uh, programmers, animators uh, five more weeks. Maybe those guys now can put in that new risky feature that would increase the fun factor in your game. That's why production efficiency matters. You know, you often hear, hear designing in a vacuum, that'll get you, you know, to spark your imagination and create the uh, ideas without constraints. To me, that's a luxury, because in all my years, there's always been a deadline and there's always been a cost to everything. So to me, a good designer isn't one who can make up a good idea in a vacuum, it's one who can execute an idea, who can see a problem and solve it uh, and move on to the next thing. So thus, your efficiency in your design and your production makes you makes help make a better game. So where did I learn all this stuff? Well, when it comes to low level um, combat mechanics, I think you can learn everything you need to know from Punch-Out. Uh, for me particularly, it was Mike Tyson's Punch-Out on, uh, on the Nintendo. I almost said Super Nintendo, but I'm kind of aging myself. Uh, but to me back then, that's what separated the good game player kids from the bad players, is if you can beat Mike Tyson. 
Um, now, but that's an old game, Mark. That's a one-on-one -on -one boxing game. How, how does that apply to shooters or the God of War games? Well, I think a great example of this is Batman Arkham Asylum or Arkham City. So as we continue to talk about these things, uh, kind of keep these two games in the back of the mind, and I'll reference them at particular points. So now let's actually start to get to designing that cohesion that I've been running my mouth about. We need to start somewhere. Although academically, I believe I can start at any point, whether it's an attack or an enemy or a player, since I'm trying to design with production in mind, I like to start at the player, player character-based design. I want to do this for two reasons. One, since my background is as a gamer, I think about the gamer. So I'm immediately trying to think of, the first thing I think about is, what are you, the gamer, going to be doing, how you're going to go about doing it, so, you can, so I understand how you're going to have your fun. The other reason is, since the games are multidisciplined and there's many different groups, the, the other departments are going to be wanting answers uh, sooner than later. If you start with the player character, you're able to answer those questions faster. The other thing is, now that you know what the player can't or can't do, you can immediately have integrated enemy design. Instead of designing this enemy in a vacuum and hoping that it works out with the player, let's design with understanding what the player can do. And once you know what the player can do and what the enemies can do, I want to go over uh, how to control combat. My biggest pet peeve as a combat designer is more hit points, more damage equals greater difficulty. That usually happens because difficulty is often looked at as an add-on feature that you tack on at the end of the game and to make. I believe you can factor it into as you develop the, all your mechanics and make those, uh, embed those mechanics as a regular part of gameplay. So I'm gonna go over how you can make games more difficult from both the beginning of the game where you expect the difficulty to be small to the end of the game. Uh, I went in flatline. You actually want a roller coaster upwards. Um, now, now that we've got the difficulty from the beginning and the end of the game, let's slot that to easy, normal, hard, and insane. Um, so by having the systematic approach, we can create the difficulty beginning of the game, end of the game, and all difficulty levels without having to just rely on hit points and damage. You can use those things to help flavor, but it shouldn't be your primary use of changing the difficulty. Now let's start on the, uh, since I want to start with the player, let's begin, uh, how do we go about doing it? Well, first you want to establish your core mechanics. This is what the player can or can't do. Uh, and this is where also where the, depending on the different genres also start to factor in or your target audience. So for the purpose of us, we're going to look at offense, defense, and locomotion. If we were making a mature rated game, you know, that's where we'd also tack in a dismemberment system. Or if we did want magic, we would probably need to invest in a magic system. I'm trying to keep things clean, so offense, defense, locomotion. Once you establish what the player can do, then the thing you can start to do is you need to establish your metrics. This is the actual information that the artists and programmers need to, so they can start doing their job. And with those two things, now you can start to establish the scope in the game. You can start to plan out how many different animations you have, uh, how big the levels are going to be, so how much artist time you have to build X amount of levels. So thus, starting with the player gives us a ton of information. So of the core mechanics, where should we start first? Since we're trying to answer the questions for, for the other departments, you always want to start off with locomotions first. Um, then from there, you, uh, from there, I like to go into the offense, because this is what, one, this is what most people think about when they think about combat. How can I shoot someone? How can I slash someone? How can I kick someone? You know, this is the fun stuff that players think about when they think about combat games. Now, there's a little brother here, and that's defense. Defense isn't as sexy to talk about, but it's actually a huge impact on the metagame of combat. So for instance, if enemies have defense, that controls what the player's offense is i.e. the player can't just spam and mash. The biggest problem with melee hack and slash games that people complain about is, oh, it's just a button mashing game. That's because your enemies don't have enough defense that controls your player's offense. Vice versa. On the player side of things, if the player has defense, the player is now able to react to what the enemies are doing. So this big monster, scary monster is coming at me. Well, let me jump out of the way. You know, let me block it. Let me block the attack. Let me avoid the attack. Let me do something that can deal with this big scary thing coming at me. 
if both sides don't have defense, then all you're doing is both mashing and allowing your players greater stats to win in a fight. Not fun. And there have been ship games that do just this very thing. So now let's get into the locomotion. Uh, we, since we're dealing with a knight in shining armor, OK, we can auto immediately remove a bunch of options. We don't need to fly. Thus, my aerial dogfighting with the dragon that is totally irrelevant and why we don't need those big wings. We don't need to hover. There's no magic, so there's no hovering, no floating, just straight human locomotion. I can run. I can walk. And that's about it. But let's think about the different states that you can also have. First is your default. You know, you're seeing me walk around. OK, well, we need this full normal locomotion set. Um, and you also need your combat pose and, and navigation. So here I got my sword, and now I'm ready to attack out of this locomotion. Uh, quick side note, it's pretty fun. Uh, uh, if some of you have played Skyrim, you can choose to have your weapons out or not. And we don't think about that as players because we don't walk around with a sword and shield. But can you imagine if you went around your world and it was in a fighting stance and you're talking to your teacher? Why did I get a B in that grade? <laughs> Why didn't you like my game design idea? You know, now, now it looks silly, the fact that you're walking around in your combat state. So at the very least, I want these two states, a normal one so you can interact with the world, and a combat one so your combat looks uh, interesting and dynamic. Uh, the other thing we can have is stealth. Um, for the purpose of a knight in shining armor, let's not have stealth. But it's an important thing to, to ask about and to plan for. The other thing you want to look at is your environmental interaction. Um, this is where if we're making a platform game or maybe there's a balance beam or a tightrope you have to walk over. Um, this is also your uh, climbing a ladder, uh, hanging on a ledge and um, strafing left and right. Uh, you know, all the things you can do from point A to point B. This is where you plan it out. And this is how it factors into your scope and planning out your animations for the game. Now let's get into the offense. The first thing I uh, ask when I'm approached to do combat is, what type of, uh, of offense is it? It sounds so simple, but if you think about it, uh, if it's a melee game or a range game, this question alone starts to dictate what cameras you can or cannot use. Additionally, beyond the cameras, it also affects what you, along with ergonomics, affects what your controls are for the game. So um, immediately you need to find out what's the majority of your game is going to be and if you're going to have multiple states, if you, can, um, if you can resolve the issues that you're going to need to think uh, to, to deal with the different range, melee and range. Uh, so our game is about a knight, so it'll definitely be melee based. Now, there is no magic in this world, but I, I've been cutting features, but I do want to add in a one range attack. And here we'll have a bow and arrow for the player. Two reasons why I want to give the player this range capabilities. One, from the player's perspective, it gives the player choice in how they want to enter a combat situation. If I only had melee, then as a player, I'm totally at the mercy of the mission designers of where they spawn the enemies and what the placement is. I have no choice but to run up to the, to the enemies and let them attack me as, I, uh, as the designer saw fit. But with the range capability, I can still choose to bum rush and attack the enemies, or I can stand at a far distance and attack them where I want to and let them come to me, allowing me to do, you know, uh, just to give the players different strategy. In that strategy, I was able to do as much damage while keeping myself as safe as possible. The other thing is, uh, since we're talking about a boss fight and dealing with a dragon at the end of the game, by having a range component, now the game, now the end boss isn't just about smashing buttons face to face the entire time with the dragon. Now we can give the dragon an alternate behavior. Um, I mentioned that the, the artist wanted to focus on climbing the walls. And uh, so now we have, so we can have an entire combat phase with the dragon where he's purposely out of melee range and climbing on the walls, throwing fire at the player, throwing rocks, stalagmites uh, at the player, you know, uh, using the tail attack possibly. And now the player uh, has to use the ranged weapon to maybe shoot each limb in order for it to fall off and continue fighting it on the ground. The basic thing is, 
The point I'm trying to get is it gives you a different phase of combat that's totally different. It changes the experience so you're not just quote unquote button mashing anymore. Now, the next thing I want to go into as we start to design this character is thinking about the different lethality. This is the equivalent of saying the different uh, power levels of an attack. Um, if all attacks are of same power level, then combat becomes a matter of who hits who first. That's not fun or interesting. So let's start designing. Uh, first, you have your normal attacks. These are your spammable regular attacks. Traditionally, these are also your combo attacks. So uh, I'll make up a combo. Sword slash, sword slash, uh, another slash, stat. Cool, four hit combo using the, using the weapon that you have, sword or clicker. Um, and that's your uh, normal attack we, we've given to the player. Traditionally, normal attacks are the ones that can be blocked by either the enemy or the player. Which brings us to your next level attack, your special attacks. These are stronger attacks that do more damage that typically also uh, cause different hit reactions. These are the ones that launch enemies up in the air that cause them to knock back or the ones that cause them to be stunned and vulnerable to further attacks. Usually special attacks for their increased power come at a cost. Whether this cost is a resource, a cooldown timer, or simply with more complicated controls, i.e. in fighting games. The, and then what I will define as the last level is, would be your super attack. Traditionally, this is gonna be your, your most damaging single target attack, or it's gonna be your best AOE attack. Quite possibly, it could be both. Um, but either way, and this usually comes at the biggest resource cost. It takes the full amount of super meter, or it takes uh, the most complicated controls, or, you know, or it's got the longest cooldowns. These are like your WoW uh, 31 point talents or things like that nature. And in prototype two, that was to be your devastators. Uh, now let's look into the defense of the player. I've been imagining that I've been carrying this darn shield this whole entire time. So we sure as hell better have a block. Um, I already mentioned that this is where the block can negate uh, your normal regular attacks. And as, oh, before I move on, um, the other important thing to realize about blocking is what you're doing is protecting your body or a vulnerable part and absorbing the blow. And that's important because that's why when you look at games like Skyrim, your regular attacks can be blocked, but when you do your charge attack, i.e. your special attack that's stronger, you're able to break the block um, because you're not avoiding the force, you're absorbing the force, which naturally leads to the next form of defense you can have. You can, if you can avoid a hit, then you're able to react faster and attack. If you have to block, absorb the blow, you have to recover, and then you can now attack. It's a slower form of defense and counterattacking. Uh, the last form of defense, that I, and so for our purpose of ultimate fantasy game, let's go ahead and give the player that, uh, that dive roll that, uh, to jump out of the way from big scary attacks. The third form of defense that's possible is toughness. Uh, this is where I didn't block, I didn't avoid the hit, I got hit. Crack! Uh, typically what makes one tough is more hit points. But this is where when you start looking at fantasy games where you start looking at resistances or, um, or damage reduction. More armor is damage reduction. Um, so that's how one becomes tougher. So for our game, we will improve our armor throughout the game and we'll get more hit points. That's how we get tougher. Now let's go ahead and start um, establishing the metrics. Um, the first thing that's the most important is what's the maximum speed? How fast can the player go from point A to point B? Why is this important? This starts to dictate how big your world or your level is going to be, um, which starts to inform the level, the, the artists, of how they need to build the game. What does this mean to the programmers? Well, they now understand how big the world's gonna be, so they start to figure out their memory allocation. Additionally, they now have, they understand how much they have to render in the game or, and or how much they need to stream in as the player moves from point A to point B. Uh, the other thing that you want to do is start to establish what the jump height is. This starts to dictate where the player can or cannot go. If you are not supposed to go over that wall because we didn't build anything behind it, you better make sure that wall is big enough for the player not to jump over. Or additionally, there's no props to help the player to get to that height to jump over the wall to go to a place where we didn't build. 
the last thing I want to touch on is jump distance. Um, sounds obvious, but you know, you've got a chasm of the, and you can jump 10 meters across. Well, you probably want to put the distance eight meters. You know, this is the kind of stuff that the specific level designers or uh, artists need to know. Or if we're, let's say, making a platform game, this is where understanding the distance and height establishes where you can put those platforms so that it nicely jumps uh, together. Uh, in this example, I'm starting them like this, but what if I did that? Well, now my jump arc no longer misses. So thus, once you have a predictable jump arc, you know where to put your props or um, how to build out the levels for the natural geometry in the game. I mentioned before, now with these different, with what we've already gone over and factoring in the different cameras that we can possibly use, now we have the information that most of the other departments need to establish the scope of their game. For the art department, we figured out how big the world is going to be, and therefore they now know how many levels they can build with the amount of artists they have. We went over all the aspects of the player's capabilities so the animators can start planning out uh, based upon their scope of what they can do. Same thing with programming. You know, I, I briefly touched on it. The, they know how much to render, how much memory, and now by starting off with the player, we've now established the estimates and scope for the entire game. And since we know what the player can do, now we'll go into the integrated enemy design. This is where we will now start to factor in the other, the, the, what the player can do as and we'll use a systematic approach and apply it to the dragon that we tried to, that I tried to design at the beginning. Um, so when you're thinking about combat with enemies, the, what you're actually trying to do is you're challenging the player. So let's think about how can we challenge the player based around their offense. So first, I talked about the normal attacks and the combo that you can do um, throughout the game. Well, for this big dragon, Let's just cut to the chase and say, these attacks are useless against the dragon. Well, that kind of sucks to have an attack that's useless against the end boss enemy. Well, let's then, if the regular attacks don't work while the dragon is ready to fight, what if the dragon, when it's vulnerable or stunned, stars over their heads, birds flying around, whatever, however the art wants to present it, but when the dragon's in a vulnerable state, the player now can choose any form of offense they want to do during that time period. This is where you're now allowed to use your normal attacks. Now let's get into the special attacks. This will actually be the majority of your uh, back and forth of the fight. I like to use the term combat choreography. So at this point, what you normally see or, uh, in games is enemy attacks. Player does some form of defense and counters attack. Uh, enemy gets hit or has their own defense and thus you start to have a back and forth of combat. Now when you start to take in the special attacks, um, that's, that's exactly what's going to be happening. When you can hit the enemy is usually at the, at the anticipation of an attack or after the attack where it's vulnerable and now recovering. This is when you want to use your special attacks. I also mentioned that uh, we want to use the range attack. Now this is where we then keep that design of letting the dragon have a separate behavior of running around on the walls to fight the enemy. Now you're forced to use your range attack, and now combat has a difference in feel and flow to the boss. Super attacks. Now, since it's so rare for, uh, in, in the game that I'm making, in the Ultimate Fantasy game, your supers are a rare thing since magic doesn't really exist. So if the player is taking the time to gather up all that resource to be able to perform a super, and they are purposely and tactically waiting when they want to use it, then I am absolutely OK with letting the player who does that negate one of the stages uh, of the boss fight. So if it's a five stage fight, and he, for some reason or another, he thinks stage three is the actual hardest, and he chooses to use his super attack during stage three, I'm OK with that. He purposely did it. He was tactful. He was tactful about it, and he saved up for it. I don't consider that exploitive. But if your super is something that you can do every 30 seconds, then that is an exploit, and then I would now change what would, uh, when the dragon would allow the super to hit or not to hit. So the, for the purpose of what we've been designing, um, the, uh, the player can do it at any time they want, and it just simply is a big hit, because you can only do it once in the entire fight.
Um, now let's start to design around the player's defense. We mentioned the block. Well, I mentioned before that a block is absorbing the force. If I'm, a, I'm 5'10", if I was fighting a 30 meter dinosaur slash dragon, even if you put a shield up, I don't think I'm gonna be able to take the blow. I.e., I can stand in front of an oncoming car with a shield, I'm pretty sure I'm still gonna get flattened and run over. All the melee attacks break the, uh, the player's block. So then, where can the player use the block? Well, let's give it all the, the we mentioned fire breathing attacks. So all the fire breathing attacks must be blocked by the player. Uh, let's do a shotgun uh, of fireballs. So even if the player dodges, he's still gonna get hit at the end of his dodge. Uh, there's one more flame breath attack I wanna give the player. I mentioned before that the, uh, there's a vulnerable state where the player has, let's say, 10 seconds to just unload any offense that he wants. Well, eventually <laughs> we're gonna want the player to stop that. Here's where I wanna use a Here's where we use a huge, big flame breath. Why did I want to use a long duration attack here and not with the, uh, not regularly? With that long flame breath, it now pins the player to hold the block. Now we can position the dragon to wherever we want, um, i.e. maybe the dragon wants to get a little bit closer so it now it can use its claws. Now we can give the, uh, the enemy boss a offensive pattern that the player has no choice but to react to. So instead of going back and forth, we're now taking the combat choreography to go back and forth, let the player kick ass for a little bit, now the dragon's gonna kick ass for a little bit. Combat choreography, now the, the game, the tempo of your second to second of combat feels different throughout the fight. Uh, dodge attacks we already covered. Uh, now you can't block your, the melee attacks, you must dodge it. Um, so, I phrased everything as thinking around the player's offense and defense. What we've actually really done is we've designed around the player's inputs. And we gave a specific reasons to press or not to press the button. Here's a great time to think about Batman Arkham Asylum. Uh, normally you see the white lightning around your head, you hit the counter button. Until you see the red lightning around the head, then you don't hit the counter button, you hit the stun button. Same thing with your offense. Normally you can attack anyone you want to, assuming it doesn't have, you don't have the white lighting over your head, until you come across the guy with the electric baton in front of him. Now you have to use your action button to jump over him before you're allowed to attack. Very specifically, the, in Batman Arkham Asylum, you can see they gave you reasons to press every button, and they also gave you reasons to not press every single button. And we've exactly done the same thing in our boss fight. Uh, now I want to get into that control, def uh, control difficulty. This is where if you think about uh, Punch-Out, it's a great example. They have the Minor League, Major League, and the World League. And they even have same boxers within the different leagues. Therefore, they're scaling their difficulty somehow beyond hit points and damage. Uh, the first thing they do between each of the different boxers is they give it more attacks. The second thing they do is they improve the defense or of, of the enemies as you progress. And the last thing they do is they manipulate time and specifically give the player less time to react to uh, their attacks. Um, now, why is more attacks more difficult? Well, in our game, uh, in thinking about the boss fight, some attacks were blockable and not dodgeable. Some attacks were dodgeable and not blockable. So, therefore, the player must learn throughout the game which attacks are which. Therefore, the more different uh, enemies and more enemies that are allowed to attack at the same time, that is then increases the, the, the challenge for the player to what defense they should be using and how often they need to use it. Um, and such makes it harder to react to. If you're too busy thinking about, wait, which one is that? <clears throat> then you probably already got hit. Thus, you've increased the difficulty by uh, giving the player, just having to give the player more things to react to. Then it comes to uh, defense. Um, Basically what you're doing is you're negating the player's abilities in order to control their offense. There's two quick versions of this. There's hard counters. This is the equivalent of saying, no player, you cannot do that. If I'm fighting a lava monster, I probably shouldn't punch the lava monster. I also probably shouldn't use wood spells against the monster. The lava monster, I should probably use ice or water. Uh, and soft counters are like telling the player, you can do that, but there's better options. I could use a lightning spell, but no, I'm gonna use a water spell. You know, you don't probably want to use your slowest weapon versus the fastest enemies in the game. And the last thing we can do is manipulate time. Uh, 
if you if the the dragon reaches up and breathes in for two seconds before unleashing the flame breath, um, that's one thing, and the player knows it's coming. But what if it goes from two seconds to one second to half a second? Now you're making the player react faster. The other thing you can do is start to manipulate the windows of opportunity. I've said that the, there's a stun state where we can unleash any offense you want on the enemy. What if in easy mode it's 10 seconds? What if in normal mode it's seven seconds? Hard mode, five. Insane mode, three seconds. Since you're limiting the offense of the player, that increases the time it takes for the total combat encounter, which translates to more likely the player is going to get hit with something else since instead of a 30 second fight, it's a one minute fight. And the last thing we can manipulate is those patterns that we've established. Either we can make those patterns happen more frequently or the tempo within the patterns can become faster and faster. And although this is technically covered with more attacks and more uh, enemies, your, uh, this is where your enemy compositions come in. When you ha if you've done your job right and made enemies with different strengths and weaknesses, you're giving the player more offense and um, more defense to have to interpret. Uh, the other thing is, of course, more enemies that makes the encounter harder. So uh, we'll quickly uh, go through what we've just went over. Um, and uh, I've mentioned that we've tried to challenge the player to when to pre press an input and when not to press an input. That's why we made the shotgun fire attack. Block it, don't dodge it. That's why we gave the huge flame breath. Block it for a long time, don't do anything else. Tail attacks, you gotta jump or dodge it. The super bite attack, you gotta dodge it. We also gave the multiple behaviors, the climbing on the wall, use, use your different ranged attacks. We gave him uh, the vulnerability to let the player to have some form of choice and creative usage of their capabilities. Um, so in conclusion, I hope that uh, I went through my systematic approach to how I improve and create combat. And we've done so in a way that the design was structured for production efficiency. So I'm hoping that uh, I'm leaving the audience members with the tools they need to be able to create the, the combat of your own. So I look forward to playing your future games. Thank you. Thank you.